Okay, good morning. We're going to get started. I'm Edwin Asturias. For those of you that haven't met me, I'm, uh, I direct the Latin American part for the Center for Global Health, and then uh, I'm involved a lot in Guatemala and other projects. So, um, welcome to the second day of the course. Uh, this, this day we call it the Parasite Day, and uh, we'll, we'll go from the beginning all the way to uh, the most uh, interesting pathogens that you have seen. And so uh, this morning we have uh, uh, two great uh, infectious disease uh, specialists, uh, Dr. James Hensbauer and Dr. Kevin Messacar. They, they are with us at Children's. They both have done uh, a lot of travel and global health uh, in their lives. And uh, it's just a pleasure for us to have them here. Uh, they're going to be talking about intestinal parasites all the way from any one that you can think of uh, that actually is uh, extra systemic, I will say. <laughs> so welcome, James. Uh, you'll start, and then Kevin will uh, will go through the cases. So. Hi. Morning. So my, my name is James Ginsburg, I'm the yeah, uh, infectious disease fellows at uh, Children's, and uh, uh, as Dr. Sturius mentioned, have a, a great interest in global health and in parasites, and I do a little bit of research in parasites, and some of the areas that I'm most interested in will probably come through in the talk that I'm going to give. Overall, though, I'm really kind of like the warm-up band while you guys file in and have your coffee, and some really great talks, and Dr. Pottinger and Dr. Mescar are really sort of entertaining. Uh, so I think you're going to have a really great day. Uh, hopefully, just pique your your interest uh, a little bit. Uh, I think we're going to have plenty of time. Um, so it, it, you know, feel free to raise your hand or ask questions that you need, or, you know in the course of the talk, or certainly if uh, at the end, I think we'll have plenty of time. Um, I'm sorry that I will actually have to go back to the hospital after my lecture, so we're putting those all answers to all the questions. here, so we need time for the tough questions. Again, my, my objective for the first half of this talk is to try to give uh, a, maybe a 30,000 foot view of, uh, of parasites um, and to, to talk about, uh, I think, you know, a few different areas that I think give, you know, maybe a context to the discussions we're going to have later about some of the more specific pathogens uh, uh, and very interesting diseases uh, that they cause. So this is the outline of the, the talk that I, you know, I'm going to give here for the next half hour or so. I'm going to talk a little bit about sort of basic parasites, and mostly I just want to give you a little bit of a framework for maybe thinking about the names and classification of parasites. Yeah. And then I'm going to go on and talk about the, you know, some, some numbers and data reflecting the global burden of parasitic disease, and hopefully impress upon you uh, how much of a significant burden that is. I'm going to take maybe a little bit of a digression then to talk about parasites and the interaction between parasites and hosts from an evolutionary perspective, and hopefully I can make the case that that has a, a, you know, a great deal of significance for how we think about parasites and what they mean uh, from a medical and public health point of view today. Parasites, as I also want to say, you know, really are, are, are part and parcel of, of uh, in poverty and uh, underdevelopment in the world, and so I want to talk about them from a societal, uh, socioeconomic perspective, and then finally talk a little bit about some of the global health responses uh, and ways that we can, uh, you know, kind of battle this massive global problem. And then Kevin's going to talk about sort of some fun cases and get down to more specifics and Dr. And Paul Pottinger. Uh, doing similarly, and so I think uh, hopefully you'll enjoy the morning here. So we're going to start with just a couple of definitions because I think they're uh, you know they're helpful. And it turns out that for <laughs> most of the parasitic diseases, the most of the parasites out there, the names actually tell a little bit about them. So if you can think back to to some of your Greek uh, word origins, it can help you kind of remember you know what this is or what that is, and so you know. This is an example, obviously, we're not talking about ticks today, but poly ticks, many blood sucking parasites. So, this is an example of how, uh, you know, how the definitions can help us understand, uh, uh, you know, maybe something more than just the name. Parasites, you know, the, as a definition, parasite is something that's worth understanding. It, it, it implies a non mutual biologic relationship between organisms. 
of two different species where, one, the parasite lives at the expense of the host. And it's really that expense that is the, you know, defines the burden of disease from parasites. So but it's important to remember that, and that differentiates it from a lot of commensal organisms and even some parasites that may be either benign or actually function uh, symbiotically with humans or other hosts. But the parasites we're referring to are really parasites in that they impart some 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 damage or some injury exact some cost from their host. Obviously, a lot of viruses and bacteria fall into that category too, and so the, I want to mention the term macro parasites, which really refers to the the larger eukaryotic, often multicellular organisms, the worms uh, that really are what we talk about when we say parasites. But obviously, from a biologic uh, definition, you know there are a lot of other pathogens that might meet that too. And finally, just talking about definitions, I'm going to mention and talk mostly about today the soil transmitted helminths. And I just want to mention that this is a sort of a generic term for a subset of the uh, parasites that we're going to be talking about. And it's a term that you'll hear quite often. So this is the, a, a sort of a, a, a catchphrase for Ascaris and hookworms, Trichurus and some of the, and Strongyloides at times, which, which you'll hear a lot about and inform actually most of what we're going to talk about today. There is a very general classification that helps sort of maybe first organize our approach to parasites, and there are really five different classes of parasites, and their names tell you know quite a bit about them from all Greek origins. So the protozoa are the first animals, so very ancient unicellular organisms like Giardia, amoeba, uh, and, the, and and certainly uh, are very important causes of parasitic disease. The platyhelminths, platy meaning flat, and helminth meaning worm. So these are the flat uh, parasitic worms, classically the, the, the tapeworms, etc. that we'll talk about. The nematodes come from the Greek word for thread. If you've ever seen an ascaris, you might not sew anything with a thread that thick or big, but, uh, but at least it gives the impression of a long, round tube. So these are the round worms. The acanthocephala is actually my favorite name. Acantha meaning thorny and cephala meaning head. So these are the thorny-headed worms. Not a big cause of human disease, but they're kind of fun to think about thorny-headed worms uh, and round out our classification. And then finally, the first four are, are endoparasites, so parasites that exist within the host. But there is a, 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 you know, a class of exoparasites, which is the arthropods, and principally the ticks. And we're not going to talk about them today, but we know that at, at least as vectors of disease, they're very important um, things to know about. Get my water. And it, I think it's also nice, you know, that there are long lists of parasites, a little bit like giving a talk on bacteria. I mean, it, it's very hard to sort of go through them one by one, I think, without having some framework. And this is just a, a framework that, that, that I've put together, and it's not comprehensive, and it may not be entirely biologically uh, precise, but I think helps organize the way we think about these diseases and, and maybe, you know, help us remember sort of where they are and, and what class they're in. And so I, I think, you know, I'll kind of work through this. I've taken the three classes of parasites that, that uh, you know, that we're going to talk about today, the protozoa, the, the flatworms, and the nematodes, the roundworms. And then I've tried to divide them into those that have their primary life cycle or primary phase of the life cycle and primary clinical manifestations in the intestine versus those that have that primary manifestation in tissues or blood. And obviously there's a fair amount of overlap, as we'll see, but I think this gives a little bit of organization. So thinking about the protozoa, you know, most of the protozoa uh, in the intestine are well known to, to most of us, amoebas, giardia, cryptosporidium, and the protozoa that are tissue or blood uh, uh, pathogens are also very well known, and probably the most famous, malaria, but also leishmania, uh, Neglaria, which causes amoebic abscesses, uh, and Toxoplasma, a very common pathogen in both developed and developing worlds. The flatworms, before we sort of move into the classification, are often also sort of subdivided into the cestodes, and cestode comes from the word uh, for belt in Greek, and so you can sort of imagine a long tapeworm might go around you a few times, uh, perhaps a new fashion, um, but at least it gives you a sense of uh, you know, remembering what that refers to when you see that word. So those are the flatworms. 
most of the cestodes, most of the flatworms that, that we think about in their natural life cycle cause intestinal disease. And I, you know, I'll just mention that briefly here. We're not going to talk more about those today, but you know, those are the tapeworms, the you know, the pork tapeworm, beef tapeworm, the tenia, uh, solium or saginata. And in their normal life cycle, if you eat bad meat, you, you can get a tapeworm, and that's what they're supposed to do. But they also uh, have a extra, uh, you know, extra intestinal form or a form of disease, which is maybe much more important from uh, uh, the you know, human burden point of view, which is that they are also the causes of cystocercosis, uh, in particular, where you ingest not bad meat, but poop with eggs in it. And, and actually, you know, as far as neurologic disease, that's a much more significant burden than tapeworms themselves. Um, but that sort of, I guess, is, you know, is the highlights of the cestodes. The trematodes come from a word uh, in Greek that means flounder, which is a fish that has a sort of a diamond shape and it's kind of flat. So if you've ever seen a flounder or its relatives, you can kind of imagine that shape. And that's what those parasites look like uh, for the most part. They're fluke or flounder shaped. And for the most part, those are the, the important ones are those that are, uh, you know, cause their diseases in tissues and blood. So schistosoma we'll hear about later today. And then some of the other liver flukes, uh, blood flukes that, uh, you know, that are significant in certain parts of the world. And finally, the area where we're going to actually spend most of the rest of my talk today are the nematodes, the roundworms. And, and in particular, you know, of particular importance are the roundworms that cause primarily intestinal manifestations or how, you know, where, where that's where they're found. And so that's Ascaris and the hookworms, Strongyloides, Trucurus, the ones that I mentioned uh, in the category of uh, soil transmitted helmets. But it's interesting and important to know that there are also tissue bound or blood bound nematodes. Uh, including trichinella, dracunculiasis, I think maybe is very notable because it's a fascinating disease that I'm sure you've heard about and we may talk about later, but it's also very close to being the next disease eradicated from the globe, so uh, an important example. And then the filarial worms, etc., all are in the nematode class. So along the way, I'm going to show just a couple of pictures in case there are any budding uh, parasitologists in the group. And I think it's interesting because the, I'll talk a little bit later about diagnosis of parasitic infections. But this is how it's done. Uh, and it has been done for the last hundred years. Uh, and that may be changing a little bit, but, uh, you know, I think uh, it's, it's a, one of those rare kind of diseases where looking under the microscope at a sample you just collected is actually appropriate. So if anybody can name this egg, they will forever be proud of themselves. <laughs> and it's not very easy. And this one is, uh, you know, obviously I haven't done this. This one is a Trichurus egg. And this is probably, if you go and look at poop in the developing world, you're going to find this more than, the, you know, than almost anything else. Part of that is because it doesn't respond very well to deworming therapies, etc. So we're people are dewormed, you still see this egg, and Trichurus we'll talk a little bit later about, but it's also known as whipworm, and it has a really classic double barrel, uh, kind of barrel shape to it with these two end plugs. So the next section is going to talk a little bit about the global burden of intestinal and parasitic disease, and shortly I'm going to show you a slide where there are billions of, of affected individuals in the world. And I think that it's easy to sort of think a billion, you know, that it's like one million dollars. It's hard to know, uh, you know, it's hard to get a context of how, you know, how significant that might be unless you understand, you know, what diseases or what symptoms are being caused by these parasites. So I actually like to start this with just a brief discussion of some of the effects of the major uh, helminths, uh, major parasitic uh, worms that we're going to talk about later so that then you can put the numbers in, in, in slightly more uh, real context. And I, you know, I think, and we'll talk about the individual pathogens later, but you can certainly think of all these pathogens as having both acute and chronic effects. And the chronic effects are probably the, the you know, more significant uh, in terms of, you know, almost everybody will have some you know, very subtle manifestation of their helmet infection, and smaller percentages of people will have acute effects, but certainly, uh, you know, Ascaris, uh, for example, has, uh, you know, manifestations that can be quite fulminant as well as chronic, you know, pulmonary hypersensitivity because the parasite migrates through the lungs, uh, 
can obstruct the bile duct and cause uh, cholecystitis or liver abscesses. And then maybe most commonly encountered as an acute uh, uh, manifestation of Asperger's is an intestinal obstruction. And we've probably all seen pictures of you know, massive worm burdens extracted at, at, surgery, uh, you know, at surgery for... Uh, for bowel obstruction, and that's a relatively common manifestation of ascaris. On the chronic side, ascaris causes malabsorption of nutrients, nutritional deficiency, growth retardation, cognitive delays, and all of that primarily is affecting children. Um, and so, you know, while each child may not notice, you know, their individual burden unless you look more carefully, on a global scale, those the manifestations need to be multiplied by the numbers that I'm going to show you in a minute. The hookworms come through your skin primarily, although you can ingest them too, and they cause acute uh, symptoms of ground itch and abdominal pain. But they are probably more uh, uh, notorious for their chronic effects of anemia, cognitive delays. Trichuris, strongyloides, uh, the intestinal protozoa, all have a sort of dysentery or gastrointestinal <coughs> manifestation that, that can be quite severe, uh, leading to dehydration and death, but also impair nutrition and growth, uh, et cetera, on a more long-term effect. So I think, so put that in context, we're not just talking about people with worms in their tummy, it's not just gross, but that all of these infections have, uh, you know, some significance in terms of uh, individual suffering. And then we're going to multiply that times the sort of estimated burden of these diseases. And so what I've listed here, I don't know why I got the space between my eons, sorry. Uh, but, uh, you know, what listed here are the best estimates for uh, the, uh, the prevalence of these infections globally. And so you can see if you look at the soil transmitted helminths that you're, you're probably talking on conservative estimates about a third of the world's population. Um, you know, and the, the Ascaris is probably the most common, the hookworms and Trichuris not far behind. Strongyloides is less, uh, less so, but 100 million people isn't really a small number either. Um, and, uh, and then, you know, you can see some of the estimates for the tapeworms and the cystocercosis. Now, the, the sort of mortality from neurocystocercosis that I mentioned uh, being significant. It's very hard to put a number on Giardia or amoebic dysentery, but uh, again, you know, probably upwards of a billion people with at least one of those uh, in their intestine at any one time. Um, these are all underestimates, probably. The you know, epidemiology of, of, uh, of helminths is difficult in general, but when you try to make a global estimate uh, from local epidemiology, you get to numbers like these, but most of these are admittedly conservative. And so you could probably think of at least a third of the world's population infected with an intestinal parasite at one time or another, or at any given time, uh, and it may be upwards uh, uh, closer to a half of the world's population. And again, I think the other thing which we'll talk about in a minute is that a lot of this falls on children. This is a map that, like many maps, colored in the same areas of, of the uh, soil transmitted helminths in 2010. And I just bring this up to point out that, again, these are diseases of the tropics and these are diseases of poverty. Uh, and uh, since over half the world's population lives uh, uh, in these areas and in poverty, you can see that... Uh, you know, that those numbers represent, those two million represent a much higher proportion of uh, the populations in these areas. So in, in many areas, it's the rule rather than the exception to be infected with a parasite. This is a chart that I put together uh, trying to get at the morbidity uh, from parasites and to put it in context of some of the other diseases that get a lot more attention and a lot more funding. Uh, um, and, uh, and so what I've done here is chart the disability-adjusted uh, life years. It's basically a measure of one year lost of healthy life, uh, and it's sort of a, a uniform or, or uh, a unifying measure of morbidity uh, or, and uh, mortality. And, and I point out here, you can sort of see the compared to tuberculosis, malaria, diarrheal diseases, HIV, overall, that maybe the intestinal infections are not nearly in that same category. But when you look at children in particular, you start to see that that becomes much more uh, an, of an important cause of disease, particularly relative to some of these other things. So for, you know, for school-age children, we're talking about a burden of disease that really rivals tuberculosis, diarrheal disease, malaria, etc. And so 
I'm a pediatrician, and so I think the, these are numbers that get my attention. But I don't think that that the the, the greater public has the same sense that uh, uh, you know that parasites are equivalent to HIV AIDS in terms of burden on children, for example. Or, um, so I think it's important to keep highlighting that to give you a sense of that epidemiology. So this is our transition to next section. Necator. Very good. So. Excellent. So I'm not sure if this is the Cater americanus or the hookworm egg or the Ancelastoma, but I think you're probably right. So this is a, a, a hookworm egg. I think I have a very good. Uh, what's your name? It's John. Nice work. How do you know that? <coughs> uh, some work I did in Mexico. Excellent. All right. So, so the, it has a somewhat classic appearance, this sort of clear cytoplasm around the nuclear material, a very thin shell, and uh, it's fairly distinctive, and it's the biggest egg that you'll probably find floating across your microscope slide. Um, and then you can see the hookworms are, are relatively small, but uh, they are chewing away at the mucosa. So my next sort of digression is, is, is to talk about parasites for, uh, and the parasite-host interaction from an evolutionary uh, perspective. Um, and this is a, a picture of a, a thing called a coprolite, which is a fossilized poop. Um, and you don't get many chances to put fossilized poops in a lecture, and so uh, <laughs> I thought I would throw that in here. But this is a, a, you know, this is a stool that uh, contained Ascaris from a Peruvian uh, archaeologic site about 4,500 years ago. And parasites through, throughout sort of human history are, are, are sort of always there when you look for them archaeologically. Um, and we know that parasites have had a profound interaction with humans in terms of, uh, of evolution. You know, for example, the, the, we know that malaria has impacted red blood cell antigens like the Duffy antigen, and so the, a common red cell antigen that is not found in, in Africa at all because malaria uh, liked the Duffy antigen and really drove that out of African populations from an epidemiologic point of view. And so we know that, uh, that uh, you know, through human history, that the parasites have been there and have been important even from an evolutionary point of view. But to really understand you know, the, what I'm trying to get at here, we have to go a lot further back in time. This is a picture of an ant that was frozen in, uh, in amber about 30 million years ago. And just as the sort of sap came and dropped on him, this ascarid worm tried to get out and move on, but they were both trapped uh, together in perpetuity. And what this is meant to show is that throughout uh, the biologic history, there have been hosts and parasites. Uh, and almost everything, uh, you know, presently and through the history of biology has a parasite associated with it. So insects have their parasites, mammals have their parasites, fish, birds, and even parasites have their parasites, um, which, uh, which actually is an interesting uh, story we can talk about later. Um, but, but the point is that parasites have been with us uh, for, for a long time. So I'm going to go backwards. Um, and, 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 uh, and so, in many ways, have, we have co-evolved with our parasites. And so, if, if you think about evolution from the parasite's point of view, it, it has a you know, complex life cycle, complex organism. It needs to go from one host to another often. It needs to wait, bide its time. It needs to you kind of develop into a different phase inside its host and then migrate later. And so, within the host, it's really to the advantage to the, uh, to the parasite to hide you know, from the immune system and to try to not trigger an inflammatory response or an immune response from its host. Um, and from the host point of view, it, it also turns out that that is somewhat advantageous. We might think that expelling the, a parasite is the ideal uh, uh, response, but if you think about it, it you know, in a context of constant exposure, high burdens of parasites, if a host spends all its time trying to get rid of them, it ends up spending a lot of energy and it also creates a lot of inflammation. So if you stick a foreign body in your arm, let it sit there, you're going to get red, swollen, you're going to get tissue damage, and all of that is the, your own response. And so avoiding that has some evolutionary advantages uh, for the host as well. So if we think about that from an immunologic point of view, uh, I think that it, it has some very important implications for, 
what parasites uh, mean to us today. So this is a diagram just showing very basically the immune response to, to parasites. And we can generally think of the immune response as having two arms. The, on, on, one is the Th1 sort of inflammatory arm, and this is the sort of offense uh, in the immune system. So a lot of cytokines uh, generated, a lot of inflammation, and the end result is that it kills pathogens, whether those are viruses or bacteria, and to some extent uh, uh, parasites as well. But that inflammation, as I mentioned with the foreign body arm, goes along with a lot of, of tissue damage, a lot of injury, a lot of energy expenditure. And so that's where the Th2, or the other arm of the immune system, comes in. And in addition to sort of resulting in sort of protective memory and protective immunity, the, a major role of the Th2 system is to feed back onto the Th1 system and dampen down the inflammatory process. And it turns out that parasites are very good at stimulating the Th2 uh, signaling in our immune systems. And that's what has uh, sort of the end result of that long coevolution. And so uh, through a number of mechanisms, but particularly through a cytokine called IL-10, parasites drive down regulation of, uh, of the immune system. And, uh, and, and why is that important? So I, th I think there are three areas where I think that has a, a major significance to what thinking about parasites today. The first is, it's very hard to make a vaccine against a parasite. This is just a figure that we won't spend too much time with, but showing the major surface antigens of a hookworm when it's in the skin, uh, migrating through your skin in larval form, and then later when it's in the gut. Uh, um, and, and these are, you know, potentially uh, great targets for vaccine. They are always expressed. They're on the surface of this parasite as it migrates through your tissues, through your lymphatics, or sits in your gut, exposed to your gut uh, lymphatic tissue. And all of these antigens have been tested over the greater part of 50 years uh, as potential vaccine antigens. And not to say that there have been no successes, but we're not that much closer to a parasitic vaccine because these, uh, these antigens have sort of co-evolved not to react to, uh, or not to be reactogenic to the immune system. And so what this probably means is that our approach to, to the parasites, uh, to eradication of parasites, is not going to be related to vaccines in the near future. The second area where the, this comes up a lot uh, in terms of the co-evolution, where this is important, is the hygiene hypothesis. And I'm sure you have all heard of this. And, it, you know, the hygiene hypothesis isn't specifically about parasites, but, they, you know, they play a, a, a very central potential role in the hygiene hypothesis. This hypothesis is that, the, you know, it relates to the fact that we're seeing in the last decades in the developed world a lot more autoimmune diseases, such as the ulcerative colitis here. And the theory is that, related to what I've talked about already, is that over evolutionary time, we've, we've reached some sort of detente, <coughs> balance between our parasites and our, our own inflammatory responses that sort of depend on that stimulation of the down-regulatory Th2 cells. And so if you remove those parasites, uh, then you shift that balance and you no longer have quite as much down-regulation and you have more auto-inflammation, auto-immunity, and so that at one edge of the spectrum, then, you start to see uh, in, uh, autoimmune diseases. I, and I always am a little wary of talking about this because I'm no proponent of not treating parasitic diseases in the, in the developing world because it's good for their immune systems, but, because the burden of disease is a lot greater than the burden of autoimmune disease. But it does point to the fact that, uh, that there may be something we can learn from this evolutionary adaptation which will have an impact on our approach to, to preventing and treating autoimmune diseases going forward. And finally, an area that I have a kind of personal interest in is well, what, if your parasites have a high parasitic burden and they are dampening down your immune system, what does that mean for your ability to fight other infections? And then more recently, what does that mean for your ability to mount appropriate responses to vaccines? And there's been pretty good evidence in this really growing field that intestinal parasitic infection impairs ability to fight viruses like HIV, bacteria, like TB, cholera, and other parasitic infections, in particular malaria. So infections that are they're very common in the same areas where you have high burden uh, of parasitic diseases. And so treating those may also require uh, treatment of parasites. And then on an epidemiologic scale, 
This may have a great significance in terms of the burden of disease from, those, uh, from these and other pathogens. A quick question, I'm sorry. So are you saying that treating an intestinal infection, that the treatment itself impacts the immune, immune response to other viral and bacterial Yeah, that, I mean, I think, you know, a lot of this is done epidemiologically so that if you have parasites, you have slightly worse disease by various measures. From but it's these. not because of the parasites, it's because of the treatment of the parasites. No, it's right? because of the parasites. So oh. The parasites are, you know, dampening down the immune system the way they have always done to try to prevent, you know, the body from reacting against them. But it, that dampening also affects your ability to fight, you know, to attack other pathogens. And so there is some evidence in, in certain areas where that uh, treating actually sort of releases that inflammatory cascade. It can improve your response. But really most of it is epidemiologic association at this point. And then, you know, I think very, it's very important because, you know, as pediatricians, uh, we feel that, you know, immunization is probably, the, you know, maybe the most fundamental public health intervention, uh, um, you know, globally. And, it, it, you know, it's a very interesting area to look at why vaccines aren't as effective in some areas in the developing world um, as they have been in, you know, sort of studied in North America or Europe, et cetera. And there are a lot of factors that go into this, um, but parasites may be one important uh, aspect of that. And, and um, so that's a real emerging field that, that, you know, treating parasitic infection, identifying them, particularly in young infants or young children who are at the vaccine age, may actually improve the efficacy of vaccines. There are a number of animal models for that and just a few epidemiologic studies, but I think you're going to start to see much more evidence of that coming forward. We're not talking about this parasite at all. We've mentioned it earlier, but it's kind of cool. The electron microscopy of worms is totally... Is anybody in the stat with this one? Thorny head. Or thorny head. <laughs> it does. Like, that's what, yeah, but we were talking about this morning. It would be a good acanthocephala, but it's actually uh, a tapeworm. And uh, so these aren't thorns, they're more like a mustache, I guess. Like, <laughs> this is its little mouth there. And if you ever happen to be looking at one of these on our electron microscope and it doesn't have the mustache, then it's uh, probably a beef tapeworm, and the mustache is the pork tapeworm. These guys are very cool. <laughs> are they always that color? No, that's like somebody photoshopped that. <laughs> Forgot the red eye and made of orange. <laughs> so the next section I want to talk about is just this, maybe think about parasites from a societal or socioeconomic perspective. And I think, you know, you can probably see I have sort of an enthusiasm for parasites and they're fascinating, etc. But, you know, I think it, it's important to remember that you know, parasites are there because people and children uh, eat poop and are exposed to poop. And, and, and so they, they really are, you know, an intrinsic link to poverty and poor sanitation. Um, and so, uh, you know, I think it's worth mentioning when we think of that burden of disease, it's also a, a marker that, you know, that, that that many people don't have access to good sanitation or infrastructure, that they live in areas where the soil, the food, the water supplies are are completely, you know, saturated with parasites every time it rains. Um, and, and that, you know, I think approaching parasites from this point of view is a reminder that, you know, attacking parasites is also sort of attacking poverty. And I think puts it in a good context, especially to temper sort of some of my own enthusiasm for, uh, you know, for the, the pathogens themselves. And, and, and fortunately, I think that this is starting to emerge as an idea in public health. And there have been a number of people uh, and, and organizations that have tried to sort of identify the neglected tropical diseases as an entity that has a burden of disease equivalent to some of its you know, more famous infectious cousins, and then to drive uh, you know, public health interest and funding interest. And the soil transmitted helmets are really at the top of this list of neglected tropical diseases. But this list overall, you know, probably, you know, creates a, a global burden of disease equivalent to, to any other single famous malaria uh, or uh, HIV, tuberculosis. And, and again, all of these things are really manifestations of poverty as well. So I think there is some movement in the right direction. The global economic downturn wasn't very good for uh, for neglected tropical disease research and funding, but hopefully, uh, the, you know, that recognizing these as important pathogens, even if they don't announce themselves gloriously in Time magazine, uh, you know, will we'll continue to 
to drive us to, you know, to fund research and fund public health programs. And this, I guess this is just an example. This is a slide from USAID just showing maybe a growing interest in, in neglected tropical disease treatments. And the bottom of the bar graphs here are, are people, numbers of people treated by USAID and, uh, you know, up to nearly 100 million cumulatively and then each year. And you can see, uh, you know, as of 2011 that that number is increasing every year. Uh, it's still way below, and it's not the all efforts, but it's still way below the burden of disease, but to show an interest, and I hope that that will, will continue um, uh, going forward. This is our last quiz. Cities of Mexico? Asterisks. Yeah, exactly. So, so the, the, oh, very good. Oh. That's not the right button either. So yeah, so Ascaris again has a, you know, the, it, it, unfortunately it doesn't always have this shell on it. It sort of depends on how old it is in the stool. But when you see this sort of uh, uh, lobulated, you know, uh, nodular shell, uh, it's fairly classic for Ascaris. And this is also a very big egg, uh, you know, probably on par with the, with the hookworms. Um, and you can sort of see, you can tell the difference uh, when you see those two next to each other. But, you know, when you've got all sorts of poo floating around, et cetera, little bits of everything else. It can be very difficult um, to, to, to identify parasites, um, but good job. I want to talk just a little bit, sorry, my picture disappeared, um, but uh, just a little bit about deworming programs and the global health response to, uh, to parasites in general. So most of the time when we think about parasites and public health, we think about deworming programs. And, uh, you know, for the most part, the recommendation from the WHO is that deworming programs be, uh, you know, are, are a routine part of public health uh, infrastructure. Once you, your parasitic burden in your country or your, your locale reaches a, a certain uh, critical threshold. And, you know, in most of the developing world, uh, over 50% of, of children in particular will be infected with a parasite, as I mentioned. And so that's sort of the cutoff level for universal, tar universal uh, therapy, meaning everybody gets dewormed in the community. And the frequency of that twice a year, three times a year, depends a little bit about, uh, you know, on that absolute percentage in your community, as well as, as some measures of uh, the burden and intensity, reinfection rates, et cetera. But most places in the developing world use universal therapies. They go to schools and they give out tablets of, of uh, you know, albendazole or mebendazole, uh, prazoquantol, as we'll hear about if there's just a smiasis around too. Um, but that's really the most common uh, application. One, because the burden is high. Two, because that's the simplest thing to do. In areas where you have more focal disease or you have slightly lower burden of disease, you can use targeted approaches where you uh, you know, you pick out one village or one school where it seems to be highest and not every village in the district. Or you can be selective uh, in terms of identifying children who are infected. But again, when you start to do targeted or selective uh, uh, interventions against parasites, it gets to be much more labor intensive. The frequency, as I mentioned, depends on your burden. Most places give it three times a year when available, but there are a lot of countries doing sort of two times a year uh, when resources get, get uh, stretched a little bit. And that depends, you know, the decision depends on your resources and your burden of disease. Again, the medications mostly, and we'll talk about those uh, in, in later talks, are mostly the benzimidazoles, or, uh, you know, albendazole being the most common one now, but mebendazole, uh, you know, used in, in, in recent years as well. Um, and so those are the most widely used anti-parasitic medicines in deworming programs, and they're very cheap uh, and fairly well tolerated in terms of side effects, et cetera. So they're good, they're good for deworming programs. But you notice I've only put one class of medicine on here. There are a few other holdouts from previous years that are more toxic or less effective, but there really aren't a lot of options. And so one concern from a public health point of view is that you're going to start to see resistance to these, uh, to these organisms and parasites and that deworming programs are going to get derailed in a way. I also put vitamin A supplementation on the list because the literature suggests that supplementing vitamin A at the same time uh, actually makes a much greater impact on child health than just deworming alone. And that reflects both, uh, I, I think, the 
the, the fact that the vitamin A deficiency you know, is part and parcel of poverty and that you probably have some malabsorption of vitamin A due to a high burden of parasitic disease. So doing the two together in a public health program is really the ideal approach. And I just, I guess I mentioned monitoring at the bottom. Monitoring means, you know, how do you know it's working? How do you know you're doing the right frequency? And those things are very labor intensive and are not done very often uh, in, in, you know, in most areas of where the parasitic burden is high because it's very hard to collect stools, look under the microscope, judge your, you know, a burden in a whole district, et cetera. So a lot of places are just giving out uh, their medications according to the schedule they've set long ago. Um, and that may or may not be the, the ideal uh, going forward in terms of resistance. So the, just a couple of slides about does it work? You know, the, if you give all school children or all preschool children at a checkup the deworming pill, uh, you know, how effective is it? And I guess overall, you probably have to conclude that it's not tremendously effective. Um, and the, uh, that these are people who live in places where Parasites are always around, and so they're going to go home and get them again as soon as they have been dewormed. But th th there are a few areas where it seems to be most effective, and, and I've listed those here. So they're most effective when hookworm is the primary pathogen. And probably of all the pas parasites that I mentioned, the hookworm is the most significant in terms of its uh, burden of disease on, on an individual, in terms of anemia, gut inflammation, and uh, malabsorption, malnutrition. And so deworming, where hookworm is, is, uh, is predominant, uh, and if you look at anemia as an outcome, you'll see a benefit from that. Um, if you iron supplement deworming hookworms, you can also see an added benefit, and that's, that's maybe the most clear-cut advantage. Vitamin A, along with that, also provides some advantage. Um, and if you start early, that's important. We think a lot, of, a lot of these school programs begin at the age of four or five when kids are, have gone to school and the public health people go to school. But there's a big burden of disease in preschool and probably infants that, that uh, isn't addressed by those programs. So if you start early, you're going to get the greater, you know, greater advantage of treatment. And I mentioned a little bit about um, the frequency. And so the more often you give it, the more effective it probably is in high areas. But just giving them a multivitamin be enough? Well, I mean, as in terms of, in addition to your deworming? Yes. It probably would. I mean, multivitamins are of all types. Um, and for the most part, multivitamins are more expensive than a vitamin A or an iron supplement. Um, and there's always a little bit of a risk using multivitamins with iron um, in high areas of malaria or when you're not sure of dosing, etc. cetera. Um, so most programs don't use a multivitamin, but try to control that, and, and, you know, cost and, and safety. And then, you know, I think that the thing that I want to wrap up on is that, you know, that the global health response to parasites, you know, it's fine to set up a deworming program, uh, et cetera, but again, this kids go home and get parasites again. And recognizing the link to poverty and to sanitation, I think, really points the way to in the way forward in terms of, of a more longer lasting parasite eradication. And so we know that improved sanitation preventing, you know, fecal contamination of food and water, good hygiene, hand washing, you know, things that come from education, and then economic development overall can have a significant impact on parasitic diseases. And I think it's important not to, you know, to, to, to lose sight of that, that deworming programs are really a band-aid on the, on the bigger problem. And just as a final example of that, this is a, a, a meta-analysis of the a fairly simple uh, 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 intervention against sanitation, and the intervention is basically giving a toilet or not to uh, to community, and studying the difference between having a toilet and not having a toilet uh, in uh, on parasitic disease. And don't, uh, you know, they, it's a meta analysis, and so you don't, don't want to get lost in the numbers. But this line here points to the the overall average decrease in parasitic burden from all of these studies, and and it's right here at 0.5 which means that by adding a toilet to a community, you can reduce the parasitic burden by 50%. And that's really the take-home measure. This is a very simple intervention, and you know, it doesn't address poverty, doesn't address the uh, water supply, et cetera. But, but it also goes to show you that you know, in a lot of these places, they, we're not talking about toilets and hand washing. We're really talking about replacing a pit in the ground or the ditch uh, with 
with even a very minor thing that we might take for granted. Sorry, you may not know this given it's a lot of studies, but was it a specific location? Was it for each house? Was it or varied? Yeah, so I mean, it depends on the study. The numbers you see here are number of subjects involved in the study, and so most of them are, are cluster, you know, village clusters, et cetera. And they're, you know, these are from different areas of the development world, Southeast Asia and Africa. So sort of leading from, from that discussion, I, you know, the, the, I just want to point out a few future directions that, that you may hear about going forward. And we'll start with the, this first one. This is a, a, a photo from a Gates Foundation contest that you may have heard of, I think 2011 now, to design a toilet that, that uh, could be used uh, in the developing world that did not depend on plumbing. Um, and so obviously this is a bit complex, but the principle is that, you know, the concept is that you can have a, a toilet that, that, that uh, you know, can be installed in a village without any other infrastructure. And I think the criteria for this toilet was that it had to put out something useful also. And most of that was fertilizer, although there were a number of electricity generating uh, uh, toilets as well. But, but I think you're going to start to see innovative ideas. Um, it's a little bit like, you know, telephones. We're not going to try and string up wires anymore uh, to, uh, you know, to small villages because cell phone has sort of replaced that idea. And I think hopefully we'll start to see technology like this uh, emerging that addresses uh, infrastructure issues on a local level. Vaccination, I mentioned, there are maybe some early candidates for hookworm, but again, I think that's going to be a major challenge and is far off uh, for. Uh, you know, being a significant public health tool. Um, technology, I mentioned, there are a few medications in the pipeline, but relatively few, and, uh, and it's not a well-funded area for new parasitic medications. There's some outside-the-box biologic strategies. You know, they, they, there are some uh, filarial uh, parasites that have a, a, a bacteria called Wolbachia, um, or Wolbachia inside, and if you manipulate those bacteria, you can decrease the, uh, you know, the virulence of the parasite itself. And so understanding the biology of parasites may lead to outside-the-box strategies like that. And then the last one, I, I guess it's at the top of the list, but um, you know, I showed some slides of eggs uh, under the microscope, and it's kind of a, it's a great tradition to, to be part of, but it's very inefficient and it's not very accurate. And so diagnosis of, uh, of parasitic infections by PCR is really an emerging uh, technology, and I think will go a long way in terms of helping us understand the burden of disease and also assess the efficacy of public health interventions. And so, those microscope skills are, are going to be, uh, you know, hopefully a lost art eventually. I think that they're, uh, you know, <laughs> it, it's great, but it's not a very efficient tool, you know, for in these modern times. I think that's all I have to say. Probably talk too long. So, but if you guys have any questions. By your way, and we can. I was just wondering that common medication they use. What are the side effects of that? So for the most part, the I mean, so the traditionally, mibendazole was maybe you know among the more common anti-parasitic medication. It had almost no side effects. It was not absorbed systemically and, and uh, uh, worked very well. They've actually stopped manufacturing that. So albendazole is now the most common of the of the anti-parasitics that we use, and is also uh, very safe. There are concerns, I think, you know, if you read the FDA packaging, et cetera, that you can have some neurotoxicity in small infants. Most of that relates to a dose response so that every, there's one tablet out there and if you give a whole tablet to a one-year-old, you know, on a population level, you'll probably see some side effects. But reducing that dose in half seems to be fairly effective. And for the most part, there are medicines that you can give without, you know, you know seeing significant side effects even on a population. Thank you very much. Part two. Part two. This has been three years. This team has been <laughs> together for three years. And uh, I remember when, when we asked them to do this uh, three years ago, they said, geez, you know, we're not sure. Are we <laughs> the right people? 
And, uh, you know, it's, a, it's an amazing thing because I don't know how you guys do it, but every year it's better than the prior year. So Thank you. it's terrific. And uh, so it's great to have Kevin uh, continue with uh, the tag team match. Great. So uh, we're going to go from the 30,000 uh, foot view of parasites and get our hands dirty now with uh, some cases. Intestinal parasites is a huge topic. There's a, a ton of them. So we're going to go through nine very common ones. We're going to use a case-based approach and go through some of the important aspects of each and hopefully give you a taste of what it's like to deal with intestinal parasites in the global health setting. Uh, throughout the talk, I've kind of spiced it up with some pictures that I've taken during my work and travels in Africa and Central America to kind of illustrate the cases and, and add some flavor to the talk. Uh, one of my favorite pictures actually here is in the, in the first slide. I, I spent about eight months on the islands of Lake Victoria. And I think this picture just really captures the essence of the public health and specific patient issues with intestinal parasites. So this is a woman gathering her drinking water about five feet from a pig that's defecating in an area that people bathe, gather their water, wash their dishes. And the islands there are basically rocks. So people go out and defecate, that gets washed into the water, and that's their same water source that they use for all of their activities of daily living. And on the uh, other side here are the pictures of some of the kids that we dealt with there that had obvious malnutrition, signs of quashiorcor, which is one of the manifestations of malnutrition. So um, our objectives, James uh, was talking about the big picture of intestinal parasites, and I'm going to focus down to the presentation of specific uh, parasites. We're going to go through a ton of information, which is why we made some handouts for you guys. The life cycles of these parasites are pretty complicated, and I don't want you to try to memorize the details of that. As we go through, I'm going to highlight in yellow the tissues through which it passes that causes symptoms, um, and I'm going to try to focus on the unique aspects of each pathogen. Um, and our big goal is to help you guys understand the way in which intestinal parasites in the developing setting can mimic some of the things that you're used to seeing around here. Um, those of you who work in the clinical setting have probably heard the saying, when you hear footsteps, think horses, not zebras. Think of the common things, not the rare things. And I think that holds up well um, if you're practicing in the U.S., but if you're in the global health setting and you're surrounded by zebras, you should really be thinking zebras, not horses. So <laughs> the point of this slide is that you really need to know your local epidemiology. So you're not doing yourself or your population that you're working with justice if you're treating patients just as you would in the U.S., if you go in a global health setting and are practicing medicine, you need to learn what's endemic there, talk to the local practitioners, do research ahead of time, and really know what's endemic in the area. Because as you'll see through many of these cases, intestinal parasites, because they're so prevalent in the global health setting, many times will be a more common cause of the symptoms you're seeing than the diseases that you're used to in the world. <laughs> So we're going to go through some helminths, some cestos, some protozoa, and, and uh, treatment toad at the end. If we don't get through all the cases in, the, in this time, it's not a big deal. We're just trying to give you a flavor of what it's like to treat intestinal parasites in the global health setting. So uh, this is the first case. Uh, so the, each case is going to start with a vignette. We're going to go through the uh, transmission and life cycle, the clinical presentation, diagnosis, and treatment. So this little girl is a four-year-old girl who's coming into your uh, now local rural hospital in Paraguay where you're, where you're working. She's got a history of asthma, and she's coming into you with this belly that you can see in the picture. She's very distended, and she's been complaining of abdominal pain. She's vomited everything she's eaten and hasn't uh, passed a stool in the last four days. And on exam today, her belly looks and feels firm to you, and she's acting ill. So in the U.S., this would be a good case of intestinal obstruction, so either severe constipation, um, a volvulus, a malrotation. Uh, but in the global health setting, as James men mentioned, one of the most common causes of an intestinal in obstruction is ascaris. Um, so ascaris uh, lumbricoides life cycle um, is started by transmission through fecal oral spread. So you actually ingest the eggs of the parasite. The larvae invade your intestines and get into your bloodstream. So your blood, blood is pumped out uh, through your pulmonary circulation where the parasite lodges in your lung. That's where you can get the first uh, symptoms, which we'll talk about, you actually cough the parasite up over your epiglottis and swallow it down into your GI tract, which is a common uh, pathway with many of these intestinal parasites that they start out with ingestion into the GI tract, go into your pulmonary circulation, and then actually are coughed up back into your GI tract where the adult worm sits. And then you excrete the eggs, and that continues the life cycle uh, through issues with clean water and sanitation, as we talked about.
So as far as clinical manifestations, the symptoms are, are caused by the parasite passing through the tissue. So in the lung, in one of the initial phases, you can get what's called Loeffler syndrome, which is an eosinophilic pneumonitis, so inflammation in the lungs due to the parasite passing through. And that can mimic asthma, so you can get wheezing, coughing, shortness of breath. And then once the adult parasite lodges in the GI tract, the majority of people don't have overt clinical symptoms, and it's really more chronic issues with malabsorption and malnutrition. And as James nicely spoke about, vitamin A deficiency and iron deficiency are major public health issues uh, dealing with the soil-transmitted helminths. If you do have an acute presentation of ascariasis, it tends to be an intestinal obstruction. And it really depends on the size of the lumen in the patient that you're dealing with. So in children, where they have smaller lumen of their intestines and their appendix, the uh, ascaris worms will actually lodge in there and cause obstruction. So this can present like what you're used to with an intestinal obstruction or appendicitis. Um, whereas in adults, uh, their hepatobiliary and pancreatic ducts are big enough that the adult worms can fit within there. And so they tend to get more hepatobiliary or pancreatic obstruction. So their clinical uh, presentations can uh, manifest as cholecystitis or pancreatitis. It's important to note if you're working in one of these areas that worms can actually migrate with high fever or anesthesia. So especially if you're using inhaled anesthetics, it's recommended that you screen your patients before you put them under an elective procedure. I don't know if any of you have seen the gross pictures of the worms migrating, but they can actually obstruct ET tubes and can be a source of morbidity and mortality. So obviously if you're doing an elective procedure, you want to first do no harm and know your endemic areas for asteroids. As far as diagnosis and treatment, we're not going to go into egg recognition or anything like that because you are going to get that in your lab as well. Uh, but diagnosis of many of these soil transmitted helminths is by stool O&P, which you can do right at the bedside and you'll see some pictures of uh, some stool OMPs that we were doing out in the field. It'd be nice to have PCR replace that eventually, but there are many areas of the world where this is still uh, definitely the standard of care and very easy uh, to set up. Um, if you're uh, suspicious of an obstruction and you have access to imaging, usually ultrasound or endoscopy is a good way uh, to look for your area of obstruction. Treatment is actually just with a single dose of either albendazole or mebendazole, which most of the other intestinal parasites require more than one dose of mebendazole. Ascaris is fairly easily treatable. And if there's an obstruction due to a worm ball, there's actually a medication that uh, causes smooth muscle paralysis of the worms called piperacin citrate. It's kind of like botulism for ascaris worms, and it relaxes the worms that can actually allow you to pass the obstruction with medical therapy at times. But oftentimes when you have an acute obstruction like this, you have to go to surgery or ERCP to remove the obstruction. So you have to start any good parasite talk out with a, a really gross picture of a lot of worms. So those worms are actually from the girl in the picture. So this is the case out of the literature. And that's actually what was causing her obstruction in her belly. So you can see just how prolific the kind of worm burden can be even in a small child. So in your, uh, her case, you got an x-ray, you noted dilated loops of intestine, some air fluid levels, so you got an ultrasound and you sh saw a mass in her ileum. Knowing your local epidemiology in this uh, area, you know that there's a lot of ascaris around, so you called your local surgeon and they did an x lap and removed an obstruction with the bolus of ascaris worms. You treat her with a dose of albendazole and she shows a, a full recovery. So on to uh, case two, now you're moving to Cambodia, um, and you have a 12-year-old girl who's coming in to you. Um, she's complaining of intermittent diarrhea, which more recently has had uh, mucus and blood mixed in with it. She's complaining of tenismus or straining after stooling. And on her growth chart, you note over the past six months, she started to lose some weight. And on her exam, she's got some finger clubbing, and she looks pale and fatigued for you. You have a, a blood spot crit that you can get, and it shows that she's uh, markedly anemic with a hematocrit of 29. So in the U.S., this would be a great presentation, a teenager with clubbing, mucus and blood in their stools for Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis, an inflammatory bowel type picture. But if you're in a, the correct endemic area, uh, James had discussed briefly uh, what's called trichorous dysentery syndrome. So this is caused by the whipworm trichorous trichuria. Uh, the life cycle of trichorus, uh, again, is fecal oral spread, so contamination of food, water, dirty hands, you adjust the eggs. Unlike ascaris, this parasite tends to stay within the GI tract, so it doesn't get into the systemic circulation. Um, the adult worms live in your cecum and you excrete the eggs to continue the life cycle. 
The majority of people with trichers don't have an acute presentation. So if you have a light infection, you're usually asymptomatic, and your, your main symptoms are chronic issues with malabsorption and malnutrition. It's really those with heavy infection that get this trichers dysentery syndrome, which presents just like IBD. So it presents with a colitis that can manifest as bloody mucusy diarrhea. You can get that straining after stooling called tenismus. And then eventually over time, you can get signs of chronic inflammation like finger clubbing, anemia, and you can have impaired growth. Diagnosis is also by stool OMP, as we looked at the eggs before, and treatment is either with albendazole or mabendazole. So this was our lab in Kenya um, that we were able to do stool ONPs on. So as you'll see, there's no electricity there, so the door is open. This is a refractory microscope, so if it's a cloudy day, your lab's closed, unfortunately. <laughs> uh, but you are able to diagnose a lot of these intestinal parasitic diseases with a very simple lab. So knowing your local epidemiology, in this case, you do the stool OMP, you see those barrel-shaped trichorous eggs, and you treat your patient with mebendazole for three days. Knowing the issues with iron deficiency, anemia, and vitamin A deficiency, you also supplement your patient and you follow her up two months later and her anemia has resolved and she's regained three kilos. So now we're going to move a little bit into the public health realm. So I'm still thinking of that big pile of worms that came out from the lab. Yep. How long do they live once they come out? Are they moving around? So they are alive usually when they come out. Um, I don't know how long they can live outside of the body, but you regularly see them passed in, in stool in, in patients that have a large worm burden. Medical treatment, going back to the first case, does that ever precipitate obstructions? I'm not familiar with uh, treatment itself precipitating obstruction. Usually those worms pass over days as, as they're killed in a patient that doesn't have an obstruction that you treat. Um, it tends to be an acute obstruction that you have to go in surgically, but medically I haven't seen it induce an obstruction itself. The only thing that we see occasionally with treatment is, uh, is uh, hypersensitivity reactions. So you get, you know, the killing, and then the body reacts with a large allergy reaction. And you'll see that with some of the other parasites, too, and it kind of goes back to what James had said. These parasites are good at evading your immune system, but once you impair them or treat them, they release a lot more antigens, and your body goes into kind of overdrive responding to them. So this next case is actually a project that I did, and it takes you a little bit more into the, the public health realm, but now you're on the islands of Lake Victoria in Kenya, and you're doing a public health assessment of the schools and school-aged children there. So these are the schools and some of the classrooms, so very basic outdoor schools. Um, and you notice when the kids are in school that there's no latrine, so they're actually running from their little classroom down to the point down here to defecate and urinate in the water. And that's kind of the point where all the kids go to the bathroom. You also notice when your boat pulls up each time uh, for your island visits that the kids love to swim out to your boat. They're always hanging on to your boat as you come in each day. Um, and when you're doing your public health assessment, you know that the children look pale, they look malnourished, and many of them are chewing on rocks and, and soil. So um, this clinical presentation is very suspicious for iron deficiency anemia. So that sign is called pica. They're chewing on inanimate objects such as metal, soil, rocks. And it's a very common thing to see in these areas. Um, and when you have widespread iron deficiency anemia, especially in this clinical setting, you should be highly suspicious of hookworms. And we discussed some of the hookworms before, but the two most common are Nicator americanus and Ancelostoma duodenale. And the life cycle of them is a bit different than Ascaris and Trichorus that we talked about before in that you can get fecal oral spread of them, but the main mode of transmission is actually skin penetration. So these are the ones where when you're walking in bare feet through the shallow, murky water, when you're brushing against leaves of grass or blades of grass, the larva can actually penetrate your skin and get into your bloodstream. Once they get into your bloodstream, they're pumped out to, through your pulmonary circulation to your lungs. They're coughed up over your epiglottis into your GI tract, and that's where the adult worms attach and that's where you excrete the egg. So when you're out defecating on the point and that stool is getting washed into the water, that's completing the life cycle and allowing the parasite to reinfect the next person who walks through uh, that shallow water there. So some of the clinical manifestations, as the larva penetrate your skin, so after you're walking in some of these shallow water areas, you'll get what's called groundage, and that's actually the larva trying to penetrate your skin. That's a picture of my buddy's foot who had groundage after we walked uh, into one of the islands one day, and he actually ended up developing hookworm and Loeffler syndrome. So he was coughing every morning in the shower to the point of throwing up, and it took us a few days to put things together, but he was eventually diagnosed with a, a hookworm infection by OMP. It can have a Loeffler syndrome-like presentation with that eosinophilic pneumonitis, 
And then once it gets into the GI tract, these tend to be not as symptomatic in terms of an acute presentation and tend to be more chronic issues with iron deficiency anemia and malabsorption leading to hypoproteinemia and even anasarca if you have a high worm burden. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about the attachment of this worm because the main morbidity um, uh, having to do with hookworms is iron deficiency anemia. And part of it's due to the kind of unique attachment that the worm has. So here's a picture of the worm head. And it basically has a cutting apparatus that allows it to attach into the intestinal mucosal layer here. And then there's a muscular esophagus in there that actually sucks out a negative tissue plug. So it sucks out a tissue plug and is able to attach and it releases hydrolytic enzymes that allow it to get into your intestinal blood supply. So basically, slowly, it trickles your blood out of your uh, intestines. It feeds itself off of that, and over time, that leads to iron deficiency. So a pretty unique mechanism of action. As far as diagnosis and treatment, it's very similar to the others. You diagnose it based on stool O&P and characteristic eggs. And treatment is either with albendazole or mebendazole. And don't forget iron supplementation in these children because most of them are iron deficient. So uh, in this case where you're doing more of a public health intervention, you decide to do a survey of the population and take stool samples of the children. You find the majority of them are carrying ancylostoma. Um, and you start a WHO-based school deworming project with albendazole. Um, you work with the local government to construct latrines because just as James had said, deworming in itself, if you're not doing larger public health measures, helps to dampen down the worm burden but really isn't getting to the base of the problem. You really need to work on clean water and sanitation. And if you do do a deworming program, just know that it's usually not a one-time intervention. It's something that should be scheduled regularly. As part of your little study, you follow hematocrit weight and height for these students over time and you notice substantial improvement over the next two years. Any questions on the cases so far? Um, so if you know that you've been exposed or walked through an endemic area, is there any like topical prophylaxis you put in each of them? Not topical. So th there are people who do interventions giving out sandals and shoes. I personally think that's not a very effective intervention. If you live and work in these areas, especially an island type community where Water is the essence of life down there. That's where you bathe, clean, wash your dishes, get your water. It's very difficult for shoes to be an intervention to stop uh, transmission of hookworms. I think I think it needs to be a larger public health intervention of clean water sanitation. Are um, humans the only only host of the hookworms? I believe so. I'm not super into the you know biology of these, so I, I don't know other. Uh, animal hosts of the hookworm. It's very difficult because reinfection happens very quickly. So we're saying like if you went to one of these islands, gave everyone albendazole and tried to cure them, it probably wouldn't be effective. Um, it's very easy to get reinfected from the water sources. The studies that have looked at deworming and how quickly it gets get reinfected afterward um, it is very impressive on how quickly you can reacquire these worms. And many times when you're deworming, remember you're just decreasing the burden of worms. You're not eradicating them. So you're giving that one dose of albendazole and it's dampening the iron deficiency anemia that they get due to their large worm burden, but you're not curing uh, them of their disease. All good questions. Uh, so this next case, you're now in Ghana um, and uh, you are at a referral hospital, so a bigger center. And you have a six-year-old who's coming in from a rural community where she was treated for an asthma exacerbation about three weeks ago uh, with steroids. And she wasn't getting better, so they upped her steroid dose. And she's now been on three weeks of steroids, which is pretty unusual um, for, for asthma. Today she comes in and she doesn't look like an asthmatic to you. She looks sick. She's complaining of abdominal pain um, and headaches and, and really looks ill-appearing. So... Um, this is a kind of cautionary tale of the use of immunosuppressants in an area that's endemic for strongyloides. Um, so strongyloides, as James talked about, is uh, kind of one of the forgotten soil transmitted helmets. And part of it is because it's very difficult to diagnose. And I'm going to go through some of the unique parts of the life cycle of strongyloides. So similar to the, the hookworms, it, it usually is transmitted through skin penetration gets into your bloodstream, gets into your lungs, coughed up into your GI tract. So all familiar things so far. The difference between strongyloides and the other parasites that we've talked about is the eggs actually hatch within your body. So in the other diseases, 
as we talked about the diagnosis, you're looking for the eggs in the stool. With strongyloides, these eggs actually hatch within you, so the larvae are actually able to reinfect you without ever having left your body. So you can increase your worm burden without ever becoming reinfected from fecal oral spread. Um, and that's called the auto-infective cycle. And you can also, as this beautiful uh, squatting cartoon is showing, as you defecate, you can actually reinfect yourself through the perianal route. So as you're defecating, that larva can reinfect you through the skin around your anus. Um, uh, once the, the parasite gets out of the GI tract, it, it can cause devastating consequences, and, and that's when you get visceral migration. And as we talk about uh, with diagnosis, uh, you actually are shedding larva, not eggs in stool, which makes it more difficult in the diagnosis. So let's talk a little bit about, again, about auto-infection and hyper-infection. So auto-infection just means these eggs are hatching within you. The larva can reinfect you, so it can increase your worm burden without ever becoming reinfected from the outside world which means you can have persistence of infection for decades in an untreated host. Now, hyperinfection is when you introduce immune suppression. So if you're starting a patient on steroids, if you're starting them on chemotherapy, what can happen is the immune system that's normally keeping that parasite in check, that auto-infective cycle in check, um, is now gone. And what it allows is that auto-infective cycle to rapidly cycle, and it allows the, the parasite to escape uh, your GI tract and get into your visceral organs. And that can lead to dissemination of your organs, including the brain, and death. So as far as clinical manifestations, you can get a ground itch or perianal irritation as it enters. You can get a Loeffler-like syndrome in the lung. Um, in the GI tract, you can get abdominal pain and diarrhea. But the real morbidity and mortality from it is due to this visceral migration in the setting of, of immune suppression with mortality upwards of 80%. As far as diagnosis, it's really difficult to diagnose um, because you're looking for larvae, which are actually much more difficult to see in stool than eggs. Um, you can do the kind of archaic string test where you have a small piece of a sponge that's swallowed on a string and you're able to basically pull out uh, duodenal contents and look for larvae, but that's really just looking at the upper GI tract. And there is serum antibody testing, but that just tells you if the patient's ever been exposed and doesn't tell you if they have acute disease. So in an endemic area, not uh, totally useful. Treatment is with a different antiparasitic um, ivermectin. is the drug of choice for two days with about an 80% cure rate. You can use albendazole, but it doesn't tend to be as effective. And the important part and the point we're trying to make with this case is if you're going to start immune suppression, know your local epidemiology, know if you have endemic strongyloides, because it's recommended that you just empirically treat a patient before immune suppressing them if you're in a highly endemic area. So as Part of our cautionary tale here, we had to have one sad case. So um, this girl, unfortunately, um, you suspect has a, a hyperinfective cycle with strongyloides going. You stop her steroids, you start her on ivermectin, but despite your efforts, upwards of 80% mortality, she passes away despite your intensive care unit. Question. All right. Yep. Do you ever see, um, do you have to worry about like, the death secondary to a suppressed immune response that basically ramps up and you can get off those steroids? Like if you suspect strong abilities and you suspect basically visceral infection, do you want to taper those steroids so you don't get oh Yes, I would think you'd want to try to decrease immune suppression as much as you could at the same time as it's treating. Does HIV AIDS have that same effect? I don't believe so, because that's more a different kind of branch of the, the immune system. Is that like the cases that don't get cured, are they like her case where you know, the burden of disease is so high, or is it the medication not effective? So, if you have a, me like, what do you do if you have a medication failure? Yeah. Um, so, you can use a second round of medication, or you can go to a second line agent like albendazole. Um, and I, I don't know if anyone knows what the treatment failures do to most of the parasitic diseases, although there's a concern for uh, resistance with, with large scale deworming that hasn't really panned out thus far. Um, so most of our parasitic diseases, a lot of times we'll get calls about kids who, this is not specific to strong beloides, but continue to have symptoms despite therapy. And there's always the question of, are they getting reinfected from their family members around them due to hygiene issues or um, reinfected from their environment, or are, is it a treatment failure? And that's always a difficult question to answer. So I don't know if there's direct guidelines. We run into the same issue of what 
dose of steroids for what duration is considered significant immune suppression for things like PCP and things like that. Typically, a five-day burst of steroids is not considered significant immune suppression with regards to PCP and other things. Once you get upwards of about uh, two weeks or so, it tends to be more significant immune suppression. I can't answer that specifically for strongyloides because I don't know the recommendations there. I would just say use caution in terms of using immune suppression in general. So this picture is from Edwin's Hospital, in, uh, or one of the hospitals Edwin worked at in uh, Guatemala, where I spent a few summers. Um, and now you're working down there for the summer, an 18-year-old, uh, previously healthy girl is coming into you with her first seizure. So she says for the past um, month or so, she's been having some uh, kind of vague left-sided headaches. And today, she started with right-sided clonic activity and then generalized tonic-clonic seizure. Um, on exam, she's still got a right-sided hemiplegia with hyper reflexia. So in the U.S., it's unusual even here to have kind of late onset epilepsy, although it exists, but you have to be more suspicious of some focal process in the brain, whether it be a brain tumor, a, a ruptured aneurysm, a brain abscess. Uh, but if you're in an endemic area for um, a tinea or cysticercosis, it's by far the most common cause of a first-time seizure in an adult. And this is really spreading to our southern states um, where there's a lot of immigrants from Central America that more and more we're seeing first-time seizures in adults due to cysticercosis. So this has a really confusing life cycle, and I like to break it completely into two separate life cycles, and people oftentimes get these confused, but there's two groups of people. So there's the pork tapeworm carriers, and there's the people with cysticercosis, and yes, you can have both, but let's think of them separately at first. So tineiasis is the pork tapeworm carrier. So these are the people who are ingesting the infected pork. So the pork tends to be mealy pork with little seedy-like things in it, and that's actually the cysts within the tissue of the pork. When you ingest that, um, the, the adult worms basically live in your GI tract and you're a pork tapeworm carrier and you're shedding the eggs in your stool that infect other people causing cysticercosis. So your pork tapeworm carriers are here, they're usually asymptomatic and they're the kind of asymptomatic spreaders of eggs. Now the people who get cysticercosis are not the people eating infected pork typically. Those are the people infected from fecal oral spread from the other humans that are shedding the eggs. So if you're able to separate those two in your mind, that'll help you out a lot. A lot of times we'll have clinical patients at Children's that have cysticercosis and they say, oh, the family's Hindu and Indian and they don't eat you know, pork products or things like that. But that doesn't always mean you can't get cysticercosis because you can get spread from other humans. So keep those separate in your brain. And we're going to talk about the life cycle of cysticercosis is basically ingesting the eggs and then the parasite lodges in your tissues and forms cysts. And if you think about the human host, it's kind of like the pig, although we're not intermediate hosts because people don't eat humans too often, but you're getting those kind of mealy, seedy um, uh, parasites in your tissues just like the pig does. So tineiasis, now this is the pork tapeworm carriers. So they're the ones ingesting the infected pork. Uh, the larva hatches in their intestines and it forms these seg segmented worms. And as the worm matures, it basically lets go of the distal segment. And these segments are called proglottids and they're jam packed full of eggs. So sometimes people will see those in the stool, but typically these people are asymptomatic. And that's an issue because they don't seek medical care and they aren't treated. So they continue to shed for years. Um, if they do have symptoms, they're pretty vague GI symptoms. Um, the life cycle for cysticercosis now, these are the people from fecal oral contamination from the pork tapeworm carriers. They ingest the eggs. The eggs liberate the embryo and the gastric acid in the stomach. They get into your bloodstream and then lodge in your tissues where they insist as cysticerci. Um, in the subcutaneous tissues, it can cause small painless nodules. In muscles, it's a common source of incidental findings on MRIs in uh, areas that are endemic for cysticercosis. There are small calcifications seen within the muscle and usually asymptomatic. In the eye, they can cause cysts that float through the vitreous and you can actually see them and they can cause visual disturbances. But uh, most of the morbidity and mortality from cysticercosis is due to when these lodge in the brain causing neurocysticercosis. Um, and this is a, a great example of what James was talking about, of a parasite that's evolved to evade our immune system. So there's multiple mechanisms that uh, uh, these uh, cysts have to be unrecognized by your immune system for years. 
And actually, when they're alive and doing well, oftentimes you're asymptomatic. And it's not until the parasite is either treated or eventually degenerates and dies that your immune system recognizes it. So it starts to release antigen. Your immune system recognizes it, starts to cause inflammation and edema. And that's when you start to get headaches and seizures. If they're in the subarachnoid space, you can get mass effects and blockage of CSF flow, leading to hydrocephalus or increased ICP. And eventually, they'll form calcified scars. So even in people who have no recollection of headaches or symptoms, many times it's an incidental finding on brain imaging in an endemic area to see these small calcifications, which signify at some point they had neurocystisucosis. So as far as diagnosis and treatment, it's difficult to diagnose the pork tapeworm carriers because stool ONPs are actually poor for this. A stool ELISA is better. And you can use an antiparasitic which stays within the GI tract, either niclosamide or you can use praziquantel. Those with neurocysticercosis, typically the diagnosis is made clinically based on characteristic imaging in the correct clinical setting. And basically what you're looking for are these cystic uh, lesions with a mural nodule, so a little nodule attached to the wall, and that's actually the head of the worm called the scolex. Um, and usually you can make a clinical diagnosis. You can confirm that with antibody testing in either the blood or the CSF. And treatment is kind of three-pronged. So you want to treat their seizures with antiepileptics. You want to treat the parasite, but as we talked about, uh, when the parasite dies or degenerates, you can actually cause a, a robust immune response that makes them worse before they're better. So the current recommendation is to treat with steroids at the same time as you're treating with albendazole to kill the parasite. And again, that's to decrease the immune response as the parasite's dying. In some cases where you have hydrocephalus or blockage of CSF flow, you'll need uh, neurosurgery for shunts. So in this case, uh, you get a stat head CT. You note five moderate-sized cysts with surrounding inflammation and edema. So you treat your patient with eight days of albendazole and steroids. Initially, despite your steroid, she seizes and gets worse, but eventually improves and demonstrates a partial recovery. Any questions as far? How effective is albendazole in treating neurocystisicosis? It's very effective, so there's very few treatment failures. Just because a patient gets worse on it does not mean that they failed therapy. It's, it's a medication that causes degeneration over time and eventually calcification. And these patients will eventually get better or worse on their own. The parasite will die on its own whether or not you treat it. Um, there's a lot of controversy in the literature of what to do in a patient who's symptomatic that only has calcified lesions. And there's a lot of research going into the fact that you're basically disrupting neural pathways even if these things are dead and calcified and people can continue to have symptoms due to them. And there's a lot of case reports and case series of people, you know, 10 years, 20 years out from their active neurocystisicosis who still have issues due to the lesions. So I'm a pediatrician, so it really took me a lot to write a case about a 58-year-old man. <laughs> Any of the adult medicine people in here can correct me. So you're now in Bangalore, India, um, and you're at a clinic where you have a, uh, a guy coming in with intermittent right upper quadrant pain for two months, fullness of his abdomen and jaundice of his skin. So in the U.S., you'd be concerned about cholecystitis, liver cancer. ETOH. Can you give me some? ETOH. Ah, yep, so uh, alcoholism. Uh, but in a correct uh, area where you have a kind of caucus um, and you do see a cyst when you do your imaging, you want to be suspicious of an, a hypatid cyst, uh, which is a liver cyst due to a kind of caucus. Again, a complicated uh, life cycle, um, and I'm not going to go through it all, but just know you have to be in an area that has two separate hosts. So the intermediate host is usually sheep or other livestock, and when those livestock die out in the field, um, canines, so either wolves or dogs, will eat the uh, entrails or leftovers of those animals and become the definitive host. And especially in areas where you have dogs around the yard or in the house, um, the eggs are passed through the feces of the canines, and that's how the humans get infected. And so once you ingest the eggs, they get into your GI tract, they get into your portal circulation, and can cause cysts in your liver or uh, less commonly in the lung. The clinical manifestations tend to be long after you were exposed and infected. So these liver cysts really grow slowly, about a centimeter a year on average. And it's not until they start to cause mass effect where they're obstructing your biliary tree um, that they cause symptoms similar to cholecystitis. 
And the dreaded complication is if these large cysts rupture, they basically <laughs> release the fluid within, which causes an anaphylactic type reaction. And that can either happen in the clinical setting if they've been growing for a long time, or even more commonly in surgery. And it's a kind of fear of every uh, general surgeon who goes in after these cysts that it's going to rupture into the belly um, because it has significant morbidity and mortality. And in the lung, they're even more uncommon. There's different uh, types of echinococcus, but some of them prefer the lung. And when those rupture, they tend to cause coughing up of this salty fluid, and you get this crepe skin-like membrane that comes up. That's actually the cyst wall. So diagnosis and treatment. So you can do serum antibody testing to see if uh, the patient has been exposed. Um, you can look for characteristic imaging on ultrasound or CT. Um, you can attempt uh, medical treatment if it's caused... Uh, if it's caught early, and it's up to three months of albendazole, and many patients fail medical therapy anyway and have to go to surgical therapy. There are some because of the lack of efficacy of medical therapy that do two drug treatment with albendazole and praziquantel. Most of these have to go to surgical treatment. And like I said before, everybody's really afraid of taking liver cysts to surgery, and you'll see that even here in the U.S. if you have a patient who's from Mexico or other places with a but, you know, a benign liver cyst, everybody's worried, could this be a kind of caucus because nobody wants it to spill in the abdomen. Um, it, typically, you'll treat preoperatively with albendazole to try to kill as many of the parasites as you can ahead of time. And then there's a surgical technique that's been developed called the pair technique, which involves puncture under ultrasound guidance. You aspirate the fluid out of the cyst. And then you actually in, uh, inject a liquid protoscolicide medicine, and you allow that to dwell within the cyst. And that... Uh, it tends to help rinse the parasites from the cyst edge, um, and you let that dwell for about 15 to 20 minutes and then re-aspirate it out. So in your case, even though there's a CT on there, you did an ultrasound. Uh, it showed a giant hepatic cyst obstructing his common bile duct. You know your local epidemiology. There's a lot of a kind of caucus in the area. So you preoperatively treat him with two days of albendazole. You do the pear-based drainage. Um, you can actually take that fluid and look at it under a microscope, and that confirms your diagnosis of an echinococcal hydatid cyst. What time do we have until, until COVID-19? I think we have three more cases that, if we don't get through them, we're fine. You're actually till 1045. Okay, I think we're good. Are you guys still doing okay? I know it's a lot of cases to go through. Um, feel free to stop if you have questions. So you're now back in the U.S. This is a common question that comes into us on the ID pager. So uh, new immigrant or new refugee screens, uh, OMPs are recommended, although there is some change to just empirically treating people with albendazole. Uh, but stool OMPs are still done. And you're seeing a lot of these calls coming in on Ethiopian uh, refugees are coming in with a report that says amoebic cysts noted on their stool OMP. But when you see these kids, they don't look like what you've read about amoebic colitis. These kids look great. They're asymptomatic. They don't have bloody stools. They don't have mucus in their stools. So you're questioning what's going on. So uh, with this case, we're going to talk about Entamoeba histolytica, but these kids in this case actually don't have Entamoeba histolytica. They have non-pathogenic Entamoeba, um, and we'll talk about the kind of learning point there. So Entamoeba is a protozoa that comes with both cyst and trophozoic forms. The life cycle is ingestion from fecally contaminated food or water. In the GI tract, the cyst releases the trophozoic form, um, and these are enteroinvasive, so invade into the intestinal wall parasites. If they get into the portal circulation and into the liver, they can lodge and fo form amoebic abscesses in the liver, and more rarely they can get into other tissues such as brain and lung and cause amoebic abscesses there, and then you shed the cysts and trophozoites in your stool. So it's, it's rare to be an asymptomatic carrier. The majority of people are symptomatic that have amoebic colitis. And as you can see from the histopathologic slide here, you ulcerate through your submucosal layer into the mucosa, and that's what causes um, the mucus and the blood that you're seeing in the stool. And these patients tend to be symptomatic with crampy abdominal pain. They can get weight loss, and then their diarrhea usually has either mucus or blood in it. An amoebic liver abscess tends to present more acutely than an echinococcal hydatid cyst, so these patients tend to be febrile, have a large uh, liver, um, and tend to have upper quadrant pain where they're having distension and tachypnea from compressing of their diaphragm, but it tends to be less of an indolent, slow-growing presentation than uh, an echinococcal cyst. As far as diagnosis and treatment, one of the difficulties is, is on your stool OMP, you can't differentiate the non-pathogenic 
uh, amoeba, oftentimes from Entamoeba histolytica. One of the things you can look for is ingestion of red blood cells, so you can actually see red blood cells within Entamoeba histolytica, and that tells you that that's the enteroinvasive type of amoeba. It's getting into that mucosal layer and getting red blood cells. Um, but many of the uh, amoebas that you'll see in stools of recent immigrants and refugees are non-pathogenic and don't need to be treated. Um, you can also do stool antigen uh, tests or serum antibody tests to confirm a diagnosis. Um, and treatment, uh, if you have an asymptomatic uh, colonized patient and you're just seeing it in the stool, you can use one of those non-absorbed agents so it gets good concentration within the gut and perlomomycin is one of those. If you have a patient with colitis that's actually into the tissues, you want to use metronidazole because it has good tissue penetration, and then you want to follow that up with a luminal amoebicide to get rid of the residual uh, intraluminal amoebas. If you have a liver abscess, you can try medical therapy, but if it's larger than five centimeters or not responding to medication, many of those will uh, require surgical intervention. So in these cases, these patients were coming in with entamoeba dispar, which is a non-pathogenic amoeba. Um, we get lots of calls on these non-pathogenic uh, intestinal parasites. I would say take that with a grain of salt, though, because you do know that those patients are probably exposed to a dirty water source. So many of them will come in with uh, blasto in their stool. They'll come in with entamoeba histolytica, endolomax dana. All of these are uh, really common non-pathogenic intestinal parasites, but they do tell you that patient was in a setting that they're likely to be exposed to other parasites. All right, so this, this second to last case, it's a little too close to home, so this is now you, and I'll tell you this may, may or may not have been me. Um, so you're now coming home from your eight months in rural Kenya, the beginning of your trip, you were great. You carried one of those fancy hand pumps that you got at REI, and you put iodine in your water, but after eight months, that gets really old and is really tough every time you drink water, wash your dishes, basically do anything. And so um, you start to act like the locals. You buy the chlorine drops over the counter, you put a few drops in your water bottle, and you just go with it. Um, so you're back now after um, your eight months, and you see your PCP, and they say, how was your trip? How are you feeling? And you say, everything was great. And, you know, besides the seven months of diarrhea and crampy abdominal pain and the 15 pounds of weight loss, you haven't had any other problems. So um, this is a, a case of Giardia uh, lamblia, which is a parasite that we see frequently here in Colorado. People drink from uh, rivers and streams up in the mountains. Uh, but it's a very prominent intestinal parasite globally as well. Um, it's a flagellated protozoa. It comes in cyst and trophozoite forms. Um, transmission, you only have to ingest 10 to 15 or uh, 10 to 25 cysts from fecally contaminated water, um, and it's resistant to chlorination. So when you're overseas and you're buying those drops over the counter, uh, they don't uh, treat uh, giardia. Um, in the GI tract, it exists in your small bowel, and it attaches to the duodenum or the jejunum, but it doesn't invade. So unlike amoeba, you're not seeing blood and mucus in your stool usually. Um, uh, and then you're excreting the cysts in your stool so uh, you can pass on the infection to others. Um, there are uh, people who are lucky enough to be asymptomatic shedders, but most people are symptomatic. Um, and it typically starts with sudden onset watery diarrhea and then eventually progresses to the very nice symptoms of explosive, foul smelling, greasy stools, bloating, flatulence. It's a really uncomfortable thing to have. Um, I don't want to throw you guys off for your little quiz. There may or may, may not be a question of what's uncommon for intestinal parasites in terms of clinical presentation. And actually, chronic diarrhea is an uncommon presentation for intestinal parasites. Um, in this case, chronic diarrhea was likely due to the fact that the person was continually reinfected uh, with this parasite as they drank the water over time. Um, there are people who have chronic Giardia infections, but it's more uncommon. Most people have a self-limited infection. Um, some of the sequelae are malabsorption and weight loss. And then you do, even though it's not entero-invasive, lose your brush border of your intestine, so you get an acquired lactose intolerance. So when you go back to have your glass of milk that you haven't had to have or haven't been able to have for eight months, it's not as fun as it used to be. <laughs> so uh, diagnosis. Um, in the U.S., we'll use a stool antigen immunoassay, which is more sensitive, um, but you can do a stool O&P looking for the trophozoite if it's a loose stool or a cyst if it's a form stool. Treatment is with uh, flagell or metronidazole for five days, and there are some second-line agents, including albendazole and mabendazole, which don't have FDA approval for it but are effective. So if you're deworming, you are having some effect on uh, GRDN in the developing world. So you left your stool sample with your PCP. 
they called you back and said they, the laboratory pathologist saw a bunch of things that they had never seen before, uh, which also included Giardia. Um, so you take your five days of metronidazole, and on mom's home cooking, you gain 15 pounds back. And on your next trip, you decide to be a little bit more vigilant. All right, last case. I think we'll finish in time still. Uh, so this is uh, now on your next trip, you decide to go back to your previous area on the islands of Lake Victoria, and you're seeing a 10-year-old uh, girl come in for a well child check. Um, you do her normal well child exam and note that she's Tanner stage 2, uh, so that's your puberty staging. Um, and despite that, she tells you that she's really excited that she's becoming a woman, that she noticed that she just started her menstrual period because she's had some blood in her urine. Um, and you, that doesn't really jive with your pediatric training of Tanner, Tanner Stage 2. You note socially that she doesn't attend school and she's actually uh, down in the water um, as a fishmonger with her mother. So basically these people go down to the water, they buy the fish off the boats as they come in and sell them in the local markets. Um, so hematuria um, in the setting of a non-menstruating female or male uh, for that matter in an endemic area for schistosomiasis is that until proven otherwise. Um, so schistosomiasis or bilharzia um, is a very interesting parasite. It tends to come in freshwater areas, so it's, it's been a big issue with development in areas that they've dammed uh, for you know, development. They've dammed off rivers and streams, and schistosoma have been introduced to them um, and have caused significant morbidity uh, in populations. And so it's in areas where there's fresh water and freshwater snails, which are the host, um, you actually get skin penetration similar to the hookworm. Um, and this is actually a blood dwelling fluke. So once it gets into your bloodstream, it matures in the portal vein. It migrates to its preferred body part based on which species it is. And romantically, the male and the female kind of sit next to each other, fertilize the female, and they release enormous amounts of eggs. And it's actually the eggs that cause the symptoms in humans. Um, it's either in the GU tract or the GI tract, depending on the species, and you either excrete eggs in your urine or in your stool, depending on whether it's in your GU or GI tract. So clinical manifestations, if you go swimming in Lake Victoria, you will get a swimmer's itch um, from schistosoma most of the time. So you come out itching, and that's due to those uh, parasites trying to penetrate your skin. Um, you uh, are at risk for Katayama fever, although the people who live there usually aren't. So this is another instance of um, your body overreacting to the parasite. And so people who live there tend to be exposed slowly over time and become kind of more tolerant to it. Travelers or people who are new to the area um, who are infected with schistosoma, the first time that worm releases its huge burden of eggs, your body goes into overdrive and you get a flu-like syndrome of fever, uh, headache, myalgias, you can get bloody diarrhea, tender liver. Um, but really, the morbidity of uh, schistosoma comes from the chronic uh, symptoms due to the eggs trapping in your tissues and causing eosinophilic granulomas, and we're going to talk about the effects of those. So schistosoma hematobium, which is what we were seeing in Lake Victoria, um, likes to hang out in the GU tract. And so the main symptom you're going to see is hematuria of the terminal urine. So that at the end of their uh, urine stream, the majority of people will have some blood in it who are infected with schistosoma. They call it the male period there because most teenage boys will, will start to develop it by their teen years. Um, and what it uh, causes over time is fibrosis of the bladder wall in the GU tract and eventually calcification, which can lead to hydronephrosis and renal failure. And the main morbidity long-term is squamous bladder cancer due to these eosinophilic granulomas over time. The other types of schistosoma, schistosoma mansoni and japonicum are more in Southeast Asia um, and can cause symptoms either in the GI tract where you can get chronic uh, colicky abdominal pain, diarrhea, bloody stools, or in the liver where those uh, eggs are causing pipe stem fibrosis over time, cirrhosis, and eventually liver failure. Uh, diagnosis is actually pretty easy with these parasites because you, you're shedding so many eggs. Um, so when we were uh, doing our mobile clinic, we were able to do filtered urine microscopy, and usually you saw a large burden of eggs. Um, you can also do stool O and P if you're looking for the GI tract um, schistosoma. And if you're in a highly endemic area and you have a non-menstruating patient, you can actually do a urine dipstick, and most people would treat based on that, given that in an endemic area, that's the most common cause of hematuria. Treatment is with praziquantel, which is different than your other antiparasitics. And as James talked about, if you're in an endemic area and are doing deworming, the WHO actually recommends adding praziquantel to albendazole or mebendazole. 
It's a little more difficult because it's not a uniform dose for all ages, weights, and heights. And so most people um, will use what's called a tablet pool. So you basically have a little pool that has, you know, one tablet, two tablets, three tablets, and you have the whole school walk through and you see what height they come in at and, and you give them that dose of praziquantel. Um, if you're the poor traveler who gets Katayama fever, um, they recommend treating with steroids at the same time as you are treated for the parasite, and that's again to uh, decrease your inflammatory response to it. And because praziquantel is not effective on the early stage of the parasite, you actually have to repeat your course four to six weeks afterwards. So this was another one of our makeshift labs with some sheets for walls, um, and that's where we were doing our filtered urines. Um, so we did a urine dipstick. We detected hematuria in this young girl, and her uh, filtered urine showed uh, schistosoma hematodium eggs. So you treated with her with praziquantel, and her symptoms resolved. But again, go back to this case and what's going to happen to this girl who's back down in the water every day. You really need to work on the bigger public health scale. In her case, you try to get her back into school, and you really need to work on construction of latrines, clean water, and sanitation. And so lots of details, lots of cases. I hope you guys don't try to remember all of the you know, details of the life cycle and stuff, but I hope this uh, series of cases gave you a taste of what it's like to deal with real cases of intestinal parasites in the global health setting. And really, if you're gonna work in the global health setting, do your patients justice, do your research, know what's endemic in your area ahead of time, and don't just treat the patient in front of you, but think about what's gonna happen after you leave and after the next person uh, comes into your clinic, what can you do on the bigger public health scale. Uh, there are some resources here, but one resource I wanna tell you about if you are doing global health work is the DPDX uh, website by the CDC. Um, it's a wonderful, very practical website. Um, that most of my pictures of the eggs, the life cycles of these parasites came from. If you have internet connection there, it's something that we would pull up next to the microscope and look side by side at what we were looking at. It goes through public health interventions, it goes through treatments, it goes through all of the life cycles and it's free. Um, if you don't have internet availability, it's worth printing out some of the resources on there. Um, but obviously there's too much to memorize in the intestinal parasite realm, but have good references around you if you're working in this setting. And the other source um, uh, for more public health interventions is the WHO website it has wonderful resources in terms of setting up deworming programs um, and doing more uh, public health interventions in the, the global health setting. What was that first one? Uh, it's dpdx.cdc.gov. And you can just Google DPDX and it comes up. And then the second one is just off the WHO website. They have a bunch of different toolkits um, and, and some specific ones to the soil transmitted pellets. Any other questions that people have? Um, you kind of alluded to this, but uh, any idea of kind of what the thought is between exposure to the development of hematuria um, and just of Timing wise? Yeah. So. I don't know the exact answer to that. It takes time. So typically the children are exposed early in, in their early teens, start to have their uh, hematuria, at least in my personal experience. Um, but it takes time for those eggs to embed in the tissue, cause their eosinophilic inflammation. It's not typically one of the acute symptoms. So even that Katayama fever from the first kind of rush of eggs coming out is four to six weeks after. So I would say in the year's realm, usually in terms of developing hematuria. Is it true that anesthesia sort of wakes up geohelminths? So if you're uh, doing surgery in an endemic area that you want to treat with albendazole or some other agent first? C correct, especially with uh, Ascaris is the most notorious. And it depends on the type of anesthesia you're using. So a lot of the older anesthetics, so I believe it's the inhaled health, and somebody in the anesthesia realm can correct me if I'm wrong, but it's some of the older inhaled anesthetics that tend to lead to worm migration, and they'll come out both ends. So they'll come out the anus and come up and can include your, G, uh, your ET tube. Um, so, in general, if you're doing an uh, uh, elective surgery in an endemic area, you want to either screen or just preemptively treat. And how long before surgery? I don't know the exact timing of that. Usually, I would say a pre-op visit that's a week or five days ahead of time would be time enough to kill the parasite and start to pass them in your stool. Uh, most of the anti-helminthics work pretty quickly. Um, so I would think I wouldn't do that day necessarily, but a few days in advance. Edmund, did you guys have any protocols for preoperative? Oh, ideally, the longer the better, right? Yeah. 
Well, thank you guys for your time. I know it was a long couple hours, but hopefully you learned something.